them in the next hour and 10 minutes, and then we'll take our, exam, take our break and take our exam. So here we go. Force of five pounds acts in the direction of eight degrees to the horizontal. Force moves an object along a straight line from point 0.86 to point 0.2013. Distance measured in feet. What's the work? All right, so they're asking me for the work. What do you always have to do for work? Work is force multiplied with the dot product times distance. So we have to get force as a vector and distance as a vector, and then just dot product multiply those two vectors. That will be work. Okay, so let's get the uh, force vector first off. It says the force is five pounds in a direction eight degrees to the horizontal. So that means there's like the horizontal, and then here's the force, and it's eight degrees to the flat, to the horizontal. So you get the horizontal flat, and eight degrees above that, you have the force acting with five pounds, five pounds of force at five degrees, sorry, at eight degrees to the horizontal. How do I convert that force vector from degrees and magnitude of five to ij? Remember, yeah, it's going to be five cosine for i and five sine for j. Good? Getting pretty comfortable for you now? So we always convert from magnitude and angle to, to ij by cosine for i, sine for j, right? So I got the force vector. Now I just need the distance vector. So how do I get the distance vector? Well, for the distance, the, uh, the object moved from 8.6 to 2013. That's the x1, y1, x2, y2. We good so far? X and Y value, X and Y value. The first, X and Y. The second, X and Y. So how do we find the distance vector? Remember what it is? X2 minus X1, I, plus Y2 minus Y1, J. Right? It's always, it's always the difference of X values for I... Difference of x values, because that's the sideways movement, huh? The x values, the difference in x, if it goes from x is 8 to x is 20, that means it went 12 to the right, didn't it? 12i. So we'll take 12, uh, 20, whoops, 20 minus 8. I'll just write it up above here. So it's just going to be 20 minus 8, so it's going to be 12i, right? If the object went from 8 to 20, it went right 12, and then height-wise, it went from 6 to 13. So 13 minus 6, it went 7 up. So there's our distance vector. So we got a force vector and a distance vector. Everybody good on finding those? A force vector and a distance vector. Now what do we do with those vectors? We dot them, right? The work is force dotted with distance. So the work vector... Now, how do we do a dot product? Yeah, you multiply the i with the i, the j with the j, and you add them up. So you take the number in front of i for the force vector times the number in front of i for the distance vector. So that's 5 cosine 8 degrees times 12 plus the number in front of j for the, F vec for the force vector times the number in front of j for the distance vector. So 5 sine 8 degrees times 7. And then just hit the buttons on your calculator, and we'll get the work there. Make sure you're in radian mode. So what do we got? Five, okay, so eight. Radian mode? You mean degree? Oh, yeah. Make sure you're in degree mode. Yeah, never mind. Don't listen to the guy in the front. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, right. Make sure you're in degree mode. Thank you like the Wizard of Oz. Paid no attention to the man in the front. Okay, so I'm getting work equals 64.287. Mm -hmm. 
I think it's the one to round. There it is. C, 64.3. All is well? All right. Number six. So I guess I did it wrongly or differently on some other YouTube, but there it is all rightly and goodly. All right. Questions on that one before I move along from that one? Okay. So here on number question number seven. Here, let me... Okay, so here it is. Number seven, a little bit bigger. Um, okay, so as we look at the... It's one of these, you know, one triangle, two triangle, whatever things. So as we look at the uh, initial information, the main question we ask ourselves, is this going to be law of sines or law of cosines? And how do we know? Law of sines. And how do we know that? Because we have a matched pair. Right, Jose? We have a complete set. That's Jose's... Coin the phrase, a complete set, right? We have, so we have B, B, angle B and side B, so that means law of sine. So when you have B with B or A with A or C with C, you do law of sines. If you don't have that, then you do law of cosines, right? So we're going to start with law of sines. So I'll do B over B, so that means 3 over sine of 41 degrees, that was B over B, is 4 over sine of A. Good so far? B over B is A over A. And then solve. So diagonal, diagonal, cross multiply. 3 sine A is 4 sine 41 degrees. And uh, to solve that for the A, divide by 3. Boom, bring it up here. So sine of A is 4 sine 41 over 3. How do we finish and, and find A there? Inverse. Sine inverse on both sides. Both sides cancels out here. A equals, let's crank it. Um, so sine inverse of 4 sine 41 divided by 3. I'm getting 61 point, well, oh, what? so I'll just say 61 degrees. 61 degrees? Got it. There it is. 61 degrees. A. That's just, they just baited the hook. Dropped it in the waters of your test right there. They're wanting you to bite on that one. I almost did. Here's the worm. Bite away. No, we're smarter than that, right? We're, we're smart fish. We're not going to get caught in the net or the hook. Not so fast. Yeah, we got a 61. But what else do we need to do? Find the other one, right? And, and when? How do you keep all this stuff straight? Sign inverse. Whenever you use sign inverse, you got to look, and there might be, might not be, might be, might not be, you got to check it out, a viable option. So... So let me switch, get a, get a fresh screen here, and let's uh, talk about it. Let's get really specific. So I just did some work. I got A is 61. So let me write up here. When you use sine inverse. Now, notice, I don't say whenever you use law of sines. Because there are times, if you look back, that we used law of sines when we found a side, not an angle. And we never needed to hit sine inverse for that. So it's not every time you use law of sines, but it's every time you hit sine inverse. In other words, when you're using law of sines to find an angle, that's when you hit sine inverse. So, when it, so it's any time you hit sine inverse, you have to, when you use sine inverse, you must find the other option by 180 degrees minus first answer. Right? You've got to find the other one, and it's 180 minus the first answer. So I've got 61, and then the other is going to be 180 minus 61, which is 119. Yeah. So that's the other possible A. There's two possible angle A's. Everybody tracking with me. Now, that other one isn't really always possible. How do you know? Well, let's fill in the details. We already know that angle B is for sure 41 degrees, right? 
That's whether A is 61 or 119 or both or whatever, for sure B is 41 and only 41. We know that. They gave it to us right in the beginning. Well then, okay, how would I find angle C, the third angle? Subtract from 180. Subtract from 180, because we know there's got to be a 180 total. So if you subtract from 180 here, you'd get, I don't know what, 102, so 78. Subtract from 180 here, you'd get 60, 20? 20. 20. So are both of those viable? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Well, what would not be viable? If I'd gotten A to be something like 147, what if I'd gotten A, the other A, you know, to be 147, and I already knew B was 41? That's over 180. That would be no way, Jose, no way. Sorry, I'm using you, Jose. No, no, no complete set, right? That'd be no way, right? Everybody with me? The second option is allowable, possible, viable, could be, if it doesn't make the other things go over 180. So if, 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 I, I just did an if there, if the other option, for example, had been 147, I would have said, no, that can't be, because I already know B is 41, and 147 and 41 is over 180, then that other option, I would have said, no, that's not, not really a second triangle option. But in our case, it is a second triangle option. I got 119, and combined with 41 is okay. It leaves room for a third angle. It leaves 20 degrees. These two are under. It's okay because those two are under 180, aren't they? So there's actually two possible triangles here. Those three angles or these three angles. Both are possible. Both are viable. Well, is that what this says here? Two triangles possible. Uh-oh, no. Those aren't the right A's, are they? They're baiting the hook again. It's not that. It's not no triangle. It's not one triangle. We already said it's two. It's not one triangle here. It is? None of the above. None of the above. That's a pretty rough question, isn't it? Did you like that one? That was well-crafted. <laughs> that was well-crafted to determine what you really know and what you really are not sure about. That is the job of a test, right? <laughs> to find out what you really know. So when you call that a good test? Maybe, maybe, maybe not, huh? I remember I, but to get my, uh, my final degree at Cal Poly, my master's, they, they gave me a good test. They gave me an oral exam, meaning the three, my three professors sat in the seats and I had to go to the board and solve the problems. That was a good test in the sense that they would know what I knew by the end of that time and what I didn't know. I didn't really like it because I didn't really want them to know exactly what I didn't know. But um, as far as finding out what, what, what Mr. Heron knows and doesn't know, they found out. And they had, they had things to mock me about. Anyway, um, right, so, so that's a good question, huh? It really, it's really a little tricky there. But if you know, so everybody give with the two options. That makes sense? Makes sense? So when, when do you do that? When you do sine inverse. Whenever you're doing sine inverse, you got to do the second option. What's the second option? 180 minus your first answer. So I got my first answer, 61, took 180 minus I got 119. And then I said, well, is that really possible? So I wrote in the other angle, B, that they'd already given me, 41, added them up. And yeah, that was okay because that was under 180. It left 20 left for C. So yeah, that was viable. Two possible triangles were, were there. So it's none of the above. They didn't give me that, that answer. So you tell me on this one, um, look what they're giving me. Um, they're giving me capital A, capital C, and little a. So law of cosines or law of sines or cosines? Cosines. Do we have a complete set? Law of cosines. We use a cosine of something. Law of sines, right? Sines? Because we have A with A. So we have A with A, so we're going to use law of sines. Law of sines... Because we have A with A. So whenever you have A with A or B with B or C with C, you have the ratio, you have law of sines. Okay, so here we go. Law of sines. So it's going to be A, 83.2 over sine of 11.2 degrees. A over A is little c, which I don't know, over sine of c. Good there? Oh, yeah, that'd be quicker. Good job, good job. Let's do that. 
Yeah, let's do what uh, – because I don't want to find C and mess around. Yeah, I didn't even look ahead. Thank you, Jesus. You're totally right. Look, they want B from us, huh? So it make better sense to go ahead and go right for B. So little b over the sign – of B, but do I know the sign of capital B? Do I know capital B? Well, you do if you subtract it from 180. Subtract from 180, exactly. So we have A is 11.2, C is 131.6. So if you take, so B must be 180 minus those two added, huh? What is that? And we got that already? 142.8. So, two. 37.2. Am I doing that right? Yeah, okay. 37.2. So the B then is 37.2. Good? Everybody see what I'm doing? I'm looking ahead saying I need little b, so let's do A over A, B over B. It was Angel's idea. It's a good one. Good? And then we can solve for B. So diagonal, diagonal. So 83.2 sine 37.2 degrees is little b sine 11.2 degrees. To solve for that, divide by the sine 11.2 degrees. Sine 11.2 degrees, boom. Little b, hit the buttons in the calculator. Times the sine of... I'm getting 258.97, so that rounded 259.0. Did you okay with the rounding stuff there? 258.97. Now, now they say they say round to the nearest tenth. You can tell they're all one place past the decimal, huh? Let me write that again in case that's confusing for you. 258.97 is what I got at first. Remember how rounding works. I know it seems silly, like, well, we're not around. Well, it's, it's kind of easy to get messed up sometimes. Let's be, let's be really, really precise. How do you round? Circle the place you want to stop in. Look, one to the right. If it's five or more, go up. Four or less, leave it. So where do I want to circle? Circle the place you want to stop in. There. One place to the right. They're all one place to the right. Look, one to the right of that. If the one to the right of that is five or more, then this goes up. This is going up, right? If, the, if you had two, you know, it's going to go up to two, five. You tell me. If they said round to the nearest tenths, it's going to be two, five. It would, think about money. $258.97. You're going to round that nine up to a ten, which is yeah. $1.20. Yeah. 20, uh, two, well, well, no, that's okay. uh, thank you. I'm having trouble there. It's $259. It rounds to $259, doesn't it? Good? On that? Yeah. It's more of a, I was thinking like this question Let's say, how would you solve it if they gave you, like, capital A, capital B, and capital C? Would you use sign, or how would you solve that? Because you know how they always give you this one standard, or this one? There'd be a way to solve that, or? All right. So I had to learn my geometry later. Um, all right. So, uh, so let's take a look here. So um, this one, find little a. So did y'all do this one pretty good? The trick is about little a, it's not a side of any, tri well, it's not a side of a right triangle. You know what I mean? It's, it's right here. This is little a, right? That's the side of this triangle, but that's not a right triangle, is it? That's the trick. It's not the side of a right triangle. It's the side of a non-right triangle. Anyway, whatever. Let's, um, let's see what we can do. So how, there's probably a lot of ways to go here. What would you all do? But is that 48? That 48 is the whole yeah. thing. Yeah, good, good observation. That 48 is the whole thing here. 37 is there. You subtract them? Yeah, I think that's a good plan. So if you take the 48 minus 37, what's that, 11? Then this part, let me use a different color here. This part must be 11 degrees, right? Because 37 plus 11 would be the whole 48 thing. Yeah. Is that and good? Also, you can find the other angle in the, this triangle and then minus 180. I like that too. So then we know this one's 90. The whole thing's 48, so we can find this one, right? 90 plus 48, and take that away from 180 to find that one. Now I'm looking, see how I shift focus from the whole thing to part, it kind of helps. I'm looking at the whole triangle right now. I think I got all And I'm saying 48 here, 90 here, 
So find that other one because the three and the whole triangle have to make 180. 180 minus those two, what would that be? Um, 90, is it like 42, I think? Yeah. So that'll be 42. See how we're doing that? 42 there. That's what I did. That's what I did. Yeah. Okay. Tangent of 48 and the tangent of 37. Yeah. And subtract it. 60 times 37 is 60, 40 times 48. You subtract them, and you get that. Oh, yeah. nice. Oh, yeah, so I'm doing a bunch of stuff that might not be necessary. <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean, I'm sure we, this could work, too. We could, we could do all this and do something like... And use the skills we learned in this chapter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know where I'm going. I'm, I like your guys' plan better, so I'm gonna do your plan. Yeah, yeah. So you guys just said, look, look, look. We got two right triangles, huh? You, you all said, look, this is a right triangle. So let's si find that side X, yeah. right? And so tangent of 37 is opposite over adjacent. So tangent of 37 is X over 60. Good there. I like, I like your plan. So tangent of 37 is x over 60, opposite over adjacent tangent. So then, you know, put this over 1, diagonal, diagonal. So 60 tangent of 37 is 1 times x, or x. So that's, that's x. Now, call the whole thing from here to there. Call that y, and we're going to find a by y minus x. That's your plan, right? Mm -hmm. By the whole thing minus the bottom part. That'll be the A, which is the top part. Everybody see the game plan there that I came up with? Right? So it's the whole thing minus the bottom part will be the A, the top part. So let's get the bottom, I mean the whole thing now. So the whole thing is looking at the whole triangle now, kind of shift our focus. The bottom is still 60 for the whole triangle. The, the whole left is Y, so, and the whole angle is 48. So the tangent of 48, the whole thing, is opposite y over 60, over adjacent. Huh. Does everybody see that? So put it over 1, diagonal, diagonal. 60 tan 48 is 1 times y. So now we've got y, which is the whole thing, and we've got x, which is the bottom part. So a will be the difference, won't it? A will be the whole thing. Y minus the bottom part, X. So A will be 60 tan 48 minus X, which is 60 tan 37. And so that's it. So tan, okay. I'm getting 21.42. There it is, D. Everybody good? That method? Questions before I flash off of it? Clarence. Are you saying you can use the right triangle? What if it wasn't a right triangle? Do we still use the same method? Yeah, no, that was the tangent. Tan, sine cosine tangent must be in a right triangle, huh? Because you've got to have opposite and hypotenuse. You're not going to have hypotenuse without a right triangle. Yeah, right. So, yeah, good question, Clarence. Sine, cosine, and tangent, um, well, I should say Sokotoa rules. Because what I, yeah, let me back up. That wasn't true what I just said. We do sine, like law of sines, we're doing sine. Or law of cosines, we're doing cosine. Those aren't right triangles. But Sokotoa stuff is right triangles. Yeah, so whenever you use the Sokotoa rule, and I just used Toa, didn't I? Tangent is opposite over adjacent. Anytime you use Sokotoa rules, that's only for a right triangle. Anytime you use Sokotoa, that's only in a right triangle. So that's a good question because it has hypotenuse, doesn't it? And that's only when you have a right angle. Yeah, so anytime you use Sokotoa, that's only for a right triangle. Whereas law of sines, law of cosines can work for any triangle. Yeah, good clarification. I like okay. So number 10, we're trying to find that A on the left side. That's tricky. What should we do? Subtract from 180. Subtract from 180. Get the other angle inside. And then you yeah. can find out three sides, and then you could use cosine. Oh, 
lot of signs for two yeah, well, inside okay. one because yeah. you have up there. Okay, so you guys are saying get this angle here right. by subtracting from 180. Everybody good that those two have to make 180? Right, because if you're headed, you know, left and you turn all the way to right, that's halfway around, that's 180. Right. So those two angles have to make 180. So this angle here is 180 minus 52, which is 128, 128. So this must be 128, and that one's 28. So now you can find this one. By subtracting from 180, so the 128 and the 28, 156, so is it 24? So that would be 24. So we got that up there. Now, um, we can use that now. Oh, okay, I see. So now we have a pair, law of signs. But you guys are good at this stuff. I'm right, I like this plan, yeah. So angle with side, angle with side. Law of signs. So we have we have a complete pair, don't we now? We have an angle and the side across from it. So that screams out law of signs, doesn't it? Whenever even though, like Clarence was pointing out, this is not a right triangle, huh? But we're okay. Law of signs, law of cosines, you don't need right triangle. So Katoa, you do need right triangle. So we'll do law of signs here. So I can't do any so katoa. I can't do any opposite hypotenuse adjacent. None of that. That's only for right triangles. This is not a right triangle. There's no 90 degree angle here. So, but law of sines and cosines, okay, law of sines would be easy. So do those two. So that would be, so I'm going to do law of sines because I have, because I have a pair of angle and side opposite. That's what law of sines is all about, having a pair that's across from each other. I have 24 degrees and 2.3, an angle and the side across from it. As soon as you have that, you're ready to go for law of signs. So that would mean, and I can say, okay, that's, that's 2.3, right? Yeah, 2.3 over sine 24 is little a over sine 28. Anybody see that? See how it's angle and side opposite, angle and side opposite. That's law of signs. Diagonal, diagonal, 2.3 sine 28 is little a sine 24. How do you solve for the little a? Divide by sine of 24 degrees. Like that. Hit the buttons on your calculator. 2.3 sine 28 divided by sine 24. I'm getting 2.6. Five. There it is, option C. Good? On that one? Questions? Okay, Heron's formula, that's the one that says S is a half of A plus B plus C. So that's a half of 10 plus 10 plus 16, 20, 36, that would be 18. And then the area is the square root of S times S minus A, S minus B, S minus C. So that's the square root of um, 18 times 18 minus the first side, 18 minus the second side, 18 minus the third side. So that's the square root of 18 times 8 times 8 times 2, whatever that may be, 6. 6 times 8, 48. 48, right? 48 it is. So, oh, it's not there? None of the above. That's how we find area, Heron's formula. All right, number 12. Solve the triangle around uh, the links to the nearest tenth angle measure. So we have another triangle one. So on number 12, what method should we use? They're giving me A, B, and C. Yeah, law of cosines. Everybody see I'm going to start with law of cosines on number 12. Right? Law of cosines. Why am I going to start with law of cosines? We have no pair. No. No pair. A, A, or B, B, or C, C. So no... Law of signs. signs. 
right? No law of sines. You don't have a pair, you can't use the law of sines. Got to use the law of cosines. Now, when we use the law of cosines, well, let me put it this way. When we eventually get to the law, whenever we're going to use the law of cosines first, we know that next we're going to use the law of sines, aren't we? And, and therefore, what do we do when, whenever we're going to use the law of sines next? We're thinking in our minds, when we get to the law of sines in a minute, I want to make sure I don't have that double angle possibility, right? The law of sines can cause us. You with me on the thinking here? I don't know if you caught it the first time. Sometimes I would, it would help for me to see it a second or third time. I'd take a math science class. So here comes the second time. Remember the thinking. When, when you start with law of cosines, you know you're going to then, after my first step, I'm going to go on and use law of sines. We always do. Law of cosines, you always follow it up with the law of sines. Okay, and when I get there, I don't want to have to worry about that double angle thing we did a minute ago, where I got to do 180 minus to get the other option, which you, in general, do have to worry about when you're doing law of sines and do sine inverse, which I will do in a minute. I'd rather not worry about that. There's a way to not have to do that if you start with law of cosines first. There was not a way on that other problem we did a few minutes ago. There were two options. There was no way of getting around it. Because I didn't start with law of cosines. I couldn't. But on this one, I'm starting with law of cosines. There is a way to avoid the problem with sine, inverse, and the two options. How's, what's the way? Do you know? Okay, well, let me hold off questions for a minute. What's the way? You start with the largest side. Why? Because it's only the largest side that will be a problem later for sine inverse. So if I do the largest side right now, I won't have to worry about it later. Does that make sense? Was that your question? Yeah. Is that making sense? You start with the large, you start with the largest side so later you're not using the largest side when you do sine inverse. As long as you're not dealing with the largest side when you do sine inverse, you don't have to worry about the other angle. It's not even possible. It's only possible for the biggest side because the other angle is going to be more than 90, which would have to be the biggest side would go with that. And so if you've already done the biggest side, you know there's no way that other one's a possibility. Does that make sense? So if you use the biggest side right now for law of cosines, which never has the, the double angle possibility, if you just use the biggest side right now, you'll never have to worry about the second option. So let's do that. So... Okay, so here we go. So I'm going to use the biggest side, which is 8. So I'm going to use um, 8 squared. I'll bring it over here. 8 squared is 5 squared plus 4. Remember, it's one side squared, the other two side squared. Minus 2 times 5 times 4 times the cosine of the angle, which I don't know. This is going to be A because it's um, across from A. Right? I started with A, 8. This is A, so this is the cosine of A. Remember how they always go together? If you start with B, it's cosine of B. Start with C, it's cosine of C. I started with A, so it's cosine of A. Okay, so let's solve it. 64 is 25 plus 16 minus 40 cos A. Everybody good there? So what do we get? 64 is 41 minus 40 cos A. Subtract 41. 23 is minus 40 cos A. Divide by minus 40. So divide by minus 40 on both sides. We good? So bring it up here. Cosine A is minus 2340. What do we do now? Inverse. Cosine inverse. Cosine inverse. Boom. A equals whatever the cosine inverse of minus 23 fourths is. 2340ths, I mean. I'm getting 
A hundred and twenty-five point. Well, they don't want me to round, so one hundred twenty-five degrees. Oh, to nearest tip. So I better, I better use a couple places, huh? Point all go point oh nine nine. Yeah, use more accuracy till the end, right? I'll use three places just to be safe. One twenty five point oh nine nine degrees. So I've got A. Now there's two options that have that angle, huh? Both A and B, and of course there's always the none of the above, which we're so thankful is there. So um, I gotta I gotta know which of those two or maybe none of the above it is. So I gotta find more angles than just A. How am I gonna find another angle now? Now we move into law of sines, right? So whenever we start with law of cosines, we move into law of sines. So now let's move into law of sines. So law of sines. And that, because now I have A and A. So that means 8 over sine of 125.099 degrees equals what? Well, how about I just do B? doesn't matter which one you do now. doesn't matter at all. We've already got the largest one. So B over sine B, or you could do C over sine C. It matters not at all. And go diagonal, diagonal. So 8 sine B is 5 sine 125.099 degrees. Divide by 8. So sine B is 5 sine 125.099 degrees over 8. Last step to get sine alone there. I mean B alone, sine inverse. Sine inverse of both sides. So B equals whatever the sine inverse of that is. Sine inverse of 5. I'm getting 30 point, 30.753 degrees. So that's B. That rounds to 31. So it must be A, B. There's A and B, correct. And C, double check. Is that, is that 180 minus the other ones? 150, C. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Option A. Is that good? Making sense? We're doing on time, okay. All right, two forces, F1, F2, magnitude 60, 70, blah, 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 blah. You've read the problem. Let me just get right to it. So I'm going to put the particle right there at the center of a make-believe axis system. See how we use math made up to do things that are real, right? If you have a particle that has two forces acting upon it, just put it in the middle of an axis system. Now, axis systems aren't real. We don't walk around and say, I looked at the object, there was an axis system right there on it. No, we're making that up to make the math easy for us to do things in real. That's how math works in the real world. All right, here we go. North, 40 degrees east. Are you good at the bearing stuff? This is north, south, east, and west. So if you're going north, that's straight up, but not straight north, 40 degrees east of that. So that'd be like around here, right? It's... 40 degrees to the east of north, north, but 40 degrees east of that. Is that good? And how much, so that's my north, 40 degrees east, and how much is that? 70, or 60. That one is 60 pounds. They said 60. The other one is 70. Okay, the other one is going north, 40 degrees west. So, and that, so that one's going to be 40 degrees this way, north, 40 degrees west, right? It's north, but 40 west of that. And that one is a little stronger, 70 pounds. So we have these two forces pulling on that one object. It's like two ropes. Can you picture it? It's like we have two ropes attached to this object. One is pulling up and to the right, 60 pounds of force. The other is pulling up and to the left with 70, a little bit more pounds of force. That's how strongly they're pulling. The question is, what's the result? What's the resultant force is how we say it. What's the result of all that pulling? Where's that object going to go? Or how it's going to feel pulled? Can you, just, just off the cuff, before we do all the specific math, if that object is loose and can move, where will it move? 
If one rope is pulling up and to the right, the other is pulling up and to the right, uh, sorry, up and to the left, a little bit harder, 70, than the up to the right is only 60. It's going to end up to the left to go to 90 degrees. It'll go up and a little left, won't it? Do we all picture that? See where that object, do you have a feel? It's always good to have like a gut level feel and then to do the math as well. You kind of want both things happening. You always want the gut level and this, because it's easy to forget a small detail in math. You know, you know what I mean by all that? Right, is that good? I remember, I still remember my, my, I had my good friend at um, junior college, he went away to Cal Poly with me. He's an engineer back in the East Coast with GE now. Um, I think he's an executive or something. I think he's done well. Anyway, back in the junior college days, we were taking all these kind of classes together uh, up in Sacramento. And we took statics, which is, which is a class like this, where you're doing all these forces, engineering kind of class, different forces on an object. And, and you know, we had, I remember, still remember in that, one of the tests we had this box. And it was sitting on a table, and there was a, a force rotating it up and a force from the side. There was all these different forces, and Mr. Sperry, our engineering teacher asked us to figure stuff out about it. Anyway, we all, the exam was over. We were all out in the hall after the exam talking about the exam. And, you know, like three of us were like, yeah, what'd you, what'd you do with that forest? Did you move that? Da, 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 da. And then, um, and then we, we started talking about the gravity, you know, because gravity pulls down on objects, right? That's one of the forces. Oh, that's what's sitting, keeping you in your seat right now is gravity. It's pulling down on you, right? Anyway, I remember, you know, we, we were talking about it. And all of a sudden, my, my good friend, who is now back east, because he went, oh, gravity. I forgot about the gravity on the box. So I just, I just love to kid him at that point. I'm like, really? No gravity? On the, I said, well, did you, did you answer then? You know, if there's no gravity pulling down on that box, it would just float up. So did you give the altitude at which the, uh, I just kid him. He's like, I hate talking about the test right after. I hate it. I won't talk about the test anymore. <laughs> It's funny. So I, sh I should give him a call. I still remember that memory. Anyway, so there's a lot to remember. So you always want to have a gut level. My buddy lost his gut level at that. But there, there, remember, so just be real for a minute. You want to be real and mathematical. Because math is to describe things that are real. And math itself is not real. So you've got to keep reality with you. So, so being real again, where is this object going to go? One's upright, 60 pounds. Up left, 70 pounds. The 70's stronger. They're both pulling up. It's going to go way up. And a little left, because the left of the 70 is going to outweigh the right of the 60. Right. So we're expecting an answer that goes way up and a little left. If we don't get that, go back and check your work. Right? That's how you, if you're moving forward in math science, that's what you want to do. You want to have reality on one side of your brain and then the math. Because it's so easy to just do a, a negative sign wrong, forget the gravity, do some little silly thing. But if you have reality with you, you'll go, ah. Oh, you know, if, if I get this thing going up in the right, I'm going to stop and back up and go, okay, I did something wrong. That, that thing is not going up into the right. So what did I do? And, oh, there's my sign error. You know, you, that's how you learn to check yourself. You keep reality with you. You know, it, it doesn't just be numbers on a page. It's got to be something real. So this, this particle is going to go up and left, isn't it? Mainly up, a little left. All right. So here we go. Let's make that happen. What we have to do is basically, how do you find a resultant force? What's the result of two forces? Well, you make them both into ij vectors and you add them up. That's all. To find the result of two forces, you add them. And you say, what's the result? What do they add up to be? So I just have to turn both these forces into ij forces and then add them up. And I'll get the result. But then I'll also have to convert it back because they make me go back into the magnitude angle kind of language. So here we go. So I don't know which way I did it on the other YouTube, but here's a good way. So how do I take this force and turn it into IJ? Notice it's the hypotenuse of a right triangle. 60 cosine. Yeah. This is going to be 60 cosine. Oh, now what angle? 50. Good job. Yeah. So you guys are thinking, right, the angle we need, when you, when you do the, you know, the, you know, the cosine, and, you know, I'm going to put some angle here, I and 60 sine of some angle here, j, right? That's how we go from degrees and magnitude, right? Uh, magnitude is 60, to ij, is we go cosine of the angle i, sine of the angle j, always, right? Because cosine's always sideways, i, sine's always up and down, j. But if you're going to do that, you've got to make sure you have the real angle. Now, what do I mean, the real angle? 
Will the real angle please stand up? Who's the real angle? Why is the 40 not the real angle? What do I mean by the real angle? What we call the direction angle. It has to start from zero. Well said. It's the one that starts. Because see, they could give me angles. They could go up here and go, hey, what's this angle? There's angles everywhere. So there's only one that's the real angle, though. The real angle is the one that starts here where zero is. So when they say, what's the direction angle, which in the end is what we're going to figure out, the direction angle, they mean from zero. So what's, what's that angle? And when I get to the second vector, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go from zero all the way to him. Those are their real angles, always starting at zero. Does that make sense? I probably didn't do that way in the YouTube. This is the clear, straight way to do it. So starting from zero to that angle and starting from zero to that other angle. Those are their direction angles. Those are their true angles. Those are the angles you must use when you do cosine of the angle I, sine of the angle J. You must use the true angles from zero. All right, so this will be, this angle is... Yeah, so you know if this is 40 up here, 90 minus 40, this angle must be 50, huh? So this is cosine of 50i, sine of 50j. Everybody, uh, everybody okay with that? So I'm getting that 50? Because 40 degrees, right? If 40 degrees is this part, so the other part must be 50, so 50 and 40 make 90. Good. Now, how do I get, let's do the other vector now. The other vector is 70, so he's going to be 70 cosine of some angle i plus 70, here I need a little more room, plus 70 sine of some angle j, right? That's the other vector. But I need his true angle also. It doesn't matter, left, down, down, right, whatever. You can do any of them, which is cosine of the angle, cosine of the angle i, Sign the angle J, as long as you have the true angle, the angle starting from zero. So the angle starting from zero all the way to his up or up left. What's that going to be? What is this angle 90. starting from zero? Yeah. Do you see the rotation? It's 90 and 40 more, isn't it? Do you all see it? It's 130, isn't it? See how it's 90 and 40 more? The direction angle is 130 degrees for that Force, 130 degrees. 130 degrees. Is that good? Is that making sense? So 130 degrees is the direction angle. All is well? So now we have this force, we have the other force. How do we get the result? We add them up. Just simply add them up. Let me get to a fresh screen. We have some room there. So I'm going to have, so force one, what was it? Uh, 60 cos 50. So it's going to be 60 cosine 50 degrees I plus 60 sine 50 degrees J. And then the second force was 70. And it was the cosine 130, right? We had 130. Yeah. 130 degrees I plus 70 sine. What am I doing? Sine is always for J. Sine of 130 J. Add them up. This will be the resultant force. What is the result? Just hit the buttons on your K. Now use a lot of accuracy because we have a couple more steps to do here. In fact, I want to squeeze that in a little bit better. I got more steps to do here. And up here, so add these up. And so um, the resultant force, so 60 cosine 50 plus 70 cosine 130. I'm getting negative 6.427i. Look at that, negative, that's back, that's left. Remember, we expected that, didn't we? We said left and up, a little bit left. It's working out beautifully with what our common sense tells us. And this is 99.585J. So it's a little left, but mainly up. Look at that, almost 100 pounds 
of upward force on that object and only a little bit of left pull, only six pounds left. That's, that's just what we thought. Left and mainly up, huh? Right, a little bit left, mainly up, because the left overcomes the right, because 70 is bigger than 60, but they're both pulling up quite a bit. 70 and 60. Why isn't it 130 up? Why isn't it, why isn't it 70 up, 60 up, 130 up? Well, because that whole 70 is not up. It's, it's up and left. Some of that 70 is going left. Some of that 60 is going right. It's not all up. How much ends up being up? Together, almost 100 pounds of up and 6 pounds left. That's the result. Now, that's not how they want the answer. They want me to go back from 1 back to Uno, right? I've got to translate languages. They want me to go from this back into magnitude. Look at the answers. See, they want magnitude and angle. I've got to go back into that language, magnitude and angle. How do I do it? How do you go from IJ to magnitude angle? Let's start with magnitude. What's the magnitude of that resultant force? Yeah, it's the hypotenuse. Every vector is the hypotenuse of a right triangle, isn't it? Right, here's the, re the result is something like this. It's up and left. So if you can make a right triangle right there, it's back 6.4 whatever, up 99 point whatever. It's a little right triangle, isn't it? Every vector is the hypotenuse of a right triangle. So the I and the J are the two sides of the right triangle. So the hypotenuse, C, A squared plus B squared is C squared. So C is the square root of A squared plus B squared. That's how you always do magnitude. It's the square root of one side squared, right? That's how we always do magnitude. Are you clear on that today? There'll definitely be magnitude questions. It's the square root of one side squared plus the other side squared. So that'll be the magnitude. Careful, make sure you put those in their own parentheses or you'll get the wrong answer there. I'm getting 99.792 for the results. So make sure you put parentheses around that negative 6 or it won't do the right, your calculator won't do the right thing. Do you know there's a difference between negative 6 squared and negative 6 parentheses squared? The first one just means one negative, two sixes, so it's negative 36, whereas the second one means two negatives, so it's positive. Do you know that difference? That matters, right? So if the parentheses are around the negative, it's two negatives. If the parentheses are not around the negative, it's just one negative. So the answer comes out negative in the end, right? So make sure you have parentheses around that negative. All right, so we good now. Now, there's two answers that have that, don't they? So we also need to find the angle. So that's the magnitude. That's the total force. The result is going to pull with 99.792 pounds of force. But, but what? What is the angle of pulling? Oh, is there only one answer that way? Well, and then there's that but none of the above. No, you, still, no, you still have to find the, the angle the data, to make sure it's right, so it's not none of the above, huh? Right. So let's find the angle. So now, how do you find the angle? Yeah, I taught tangent, and that's, I just want to give you one thing that will always work. So you can always do tangent. If you, tan, you can always say um, theta is inverse tangent, inverse tangent of what? The J over the I. That's what I taught. You can always find the direction angle by that. Why? Because if you look at this triangle right here, look back with me, right? This, well, I'm kind of running out of room there. Let me just draw it right here. This resultant force, this force, it goes left and up, doesn't it? So, so his angle, call that angle... X, or, or yeah, angle theta. The tangent of theta, you see, is opposite over adjacent in a triangle, right? Tangent is opposite over J over I, so inverse tangent of J over I. We'll give it to you. But the problem is, well, let, let's do it first, and then we'll talk about the problem. Because that's not going to be the exact answer. We'll have to fiddle with that. J over I, so what's the J? 99.5 for this thing is nine, for the resultant force 99.585 over the I, negative 6.427. If 
you hit that, inverse tangent, I'm getting negative 86.3 degrees. But it can't be negative. Are you kidding me? Why are we getting this negative answer? That's not right. Like, remember what you want to do is you want to draw it on an axis system. Let me put it right here on an axis system. Our angle, remember, is back 6.4 up 99.6, let's say. Are you guys with me? Am I losing you? It's been a long problem, hasn't it? We're almost there. Do you know how to find these angles in the end? So draw, you want to draw what were this resultant force. What is it? Back 6.4, up 99.6. Back 6.4, up 99.6. So it's in the second quadrant, isn't it? Second quadrant. We want the true angle. I just did my tangent inverse, and it gave me negative. Why did it give me negative? Well, because of the weird restrictions, tangent inverse is only allowed to give you, it can't give you a second quadrant answer. It can only give first and fourth. Remember, sine numbers, tangent numbers. So whatever. Ignore that negative. This is where you've got to be smarter than the calculator. This is where you've got to know that calculator is just doing what it has to do based on the tangent inverse restrictions. But we know this angle is right here. This theta is the 86.3. I mean, that's just a reference angle, right? It's to the x-axis. But that's not the real angle I need. What's the real angle I need? Really, I need right here. That's the theta I really need from zero. Again, from zero. That's always the true one. So how do I find it? Subtract it from 180. Subtract from 180, right? So 180 minus 86.3. What is that? 93.7? That's the true angle. This direction angle is 90. It had to be more than 90, huh? It's going into the second quadrant. Now, cosine inverse would have been quicker in this particular case. It would have immediately given you the 93.7. But the reason I don't give you that is because that won't always work. If your vector was in the third quadrant, cosine inverse would be lousy. Fourth quadrant, cosine inverse would be terrible. So I'm just giving you, I'm just saying, look, tangent inverse will always give you a reference angle, and then you can just find out where you're at with, the, with the looking at the picture. But you do have to look at the picture. Find out what quadrant you're in. Find out what that really means is the true angle. So that part's kind of confusing, isn't it? So when you do tangent inverse, all you get is a reference angle. The one inside the triangle is 86, whatever. And so the, the true angle from zero, the true angle is always from zero, got to take 180 minus it. We good there? So what if it was in the third quadrant? What if we did a situation and we said, all right, I got 20 degrees into the third quadrant. What would the true angle from zero be? 180 plus 20, 200, right? It would be a full 180 plus 20 in that case, wouldn't it? What if they told me, what if instead tell me that? They said, oh, okay. Um, they, they gave it to me like uh, 10 degrees off of that axis. Well, we probably, they probably wouldn't give that because that's not a reference. It's not off the X. What, what if, let me just change it. What if they gave me like 10 degrees off that? What if that was where it is? So how would I find the true angle from zero? Subtract from 360. It's almost 360, huh? 360 minus 10, 350. You good? So whatever quadrant it's in, tangent inverse will give you the reference angle, and then you find the real true angle based on where it sits, which quadrant. Okay, so when they give me magnitude of 7, angle 225, you know what to do. 7, cosine of the angle, 225, I plus 7 sine of the angle, 225j. That's how we always go to ij. Cosine of the angle i, sine of the angle j. So then we, now, to, instead of using our calculator, normally we've, we've been using our calculator, they, you can see the options here. They want exact answers, don't they? So we just go to the unit circle. We go, all right, 225, 225. Find 225. i got to find the unit circle here first. Where, oh, where did the unit circle go? There it is. So 225. 225, cosine, sine. They're both negative root 2 over 2. So I go back, oh, okay. 
So it's 7 times negative root 2 over 2i plus 7 times negative root 2 over 2j. 7 over 1 goes to the top minus 7 root 2 over 2i minus 7 root 2 over 2j. Looks like b. Like that. Just use the unit circle. Same kind of thing. How do we find a unit vector? What does that mean, a unit vector? Yeah, length one. Unit is one, huh? So that means, in other words, like if you've got some vector, let's say it heads off that way, some vector v or whatever, they want you to just shrink it down. This would be the unit vector. In other words, same direction as the original, but it's been shrunk down to only be length of one. That's what a unit vector is. You just shrink it down, same direction. Just like you're going to the end of that vector, just shrinking it down to be a unit one vector, a length one vector. That's what a unit vector is. Uses a lot in higher math and science, unit vectors. Because you want the direction, but you don't really want the magnitude because you're doing the magnitude with something else. So um, how do we do that? Well, think about it. How do you take anything and make it one? Like if I gave you a number, like 17, and said, hey, shrink that down and make it one for me. What could you divide by? Itself. Divide by itself, and it'll be 1, right? Take 12. What do you divide by? 12, and you get 1. If you divide by yourself, it makes you 1. It makes your total length 1, doesn't it? So the idea behind making something a unit vector is just dividing by its length, right? Divide by its length. Well, what's its length? That's its magnitude. The magnitude of a vector, remember, it's the hypotenuse of a right triangle. Every vector is the hypotenuse of a right triangle. So that would be the square root of, what is this, minus 3 squared plus 1 squared. Let me get this out of the way here. So that's the square root of 9 plus 1. That's the square root of 10. So that's the length. So vector v which is minus 3i plus j. Vector v has a length. That's the length, the magnitude, of vector v. So if you take vector v, then, and you divide both his parts, his whole, all of him, by root of 10, you've just, you just shrunk him down to be length 1. Clarence? Right, so the answer is d. The thing that got me was the fact that the root 10 was at the bottom. I'm just like... Understanding, you know, that's a math Excel, but like on the test, will it be something like that, or? Oh, they left the root on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Good, good question. I was about to say, now we got to get rid of the roots from the bottom. No, it is D. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why they did that. Um, that's, that's interesting. Um, yeah, really the, the fact is you don't have to get rid of the roots from the bottom. It's just something they usually make us do. That's the same answer. So, if, so, so in other words, I will never, I will make sure never to put an answer on there that's equivalent to yours, but just looks different, and, and I don't say it's the real answer. Did that sentence make any sense? In other words, if something is equivalent to yours, grab it. I don't care what it looks like. If it's really the same as yours, but just looks different, for whatever reason, grab it. That's the answer. So are you saying for the test? For the test. No, no, no. Like, is this, what's, like... So it could be, Yeah. So it could be, now I'm not trying to do that. I just grabbed these off the publisher's website, you know, and this is what they did. But just know that in general in math and science. So, right? so now there's, now there's distinguish in your mind simplifying from being a different answer. Those are two different animals. That'd be like me saying, hey, I saw the five tenths and I had a half, but I didn't grab it. Well, those are the same thing. If they left it five tenths for whatever re weird reason they did, whatever, you know that's the same though, right? So if it's the same, grab it. Don't be hung up on looks. Grab it if it's the same thing. So we know this and getting rid of the root from the bottom is the same thing. So grab it. So is the root going to be on the bottom? The Honestly, I don't know. I have no idea. I'm grabbing these off the publisher's thing, and I'm just saying in general in math and science, if it's really the same, grab it. All right. So we're out of time, aren't we?